Welcome to Bishop Stortford Methodist Church online. The Lord heals, heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. The Lord determines the numbers of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. We sing at home the hymn number 255, The Kingdom of God is Justice and Joy. So let us pray together. Creator God, we marvel at all that you have made, from vast galaxies to tiny flowers, from mountains and forests to the delicacy of a spider's web. We marvel too that in your generosity you have given us the gift of creativity. We weave new materials out of old bottles and tires. We find new ways to tell your age-old story of redemption, and we learn new ways to heal and prevent disease. Father, forgive us that we have been arrogant and misused this gift of creativity, that we have exploited your earth and each other and cared only for ourselves. Teach us how to care for one another and the world as you care for us, that your will may be done and your kingdom come. So here is good news. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to accept us as we are, set us free from evil's power and enable us to live new lives in him. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're now going to hear the Old Testament reading from Isaiah and then the Gospel according to Mark. And Hilary is going to read for us. Thank you. 
The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, chapter 58, reading verses 1 to 12. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the th thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. The Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 1, reading verses 29 to 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening, at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went through Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. So let us pray. 
May the words of my mouth and the thoughts and the feelings we all now experience be acceptable to you, O Lord, our God and our Redeemer. Amen. These first couple of chapters of Mark's Gospel set the scene for Jesus' ministry, and it's a very active and determined ministry. In Luke, we hear about Jesus' manifesto as he preaches in the synagogue, the words from Isaiah that we heard from Isaiah 58. Uh, in Luke's Gospel, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to set, send me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free. Mark, as I say, is an active Gospel. It, it's a Gospel that races along at a pace. Immediately, Jesus did this. Immediately, Jesus did that. But as was said last week by Jan, the kingdom of God is shown in Mark by Jesus' authority over evil, evil spirits and many who are sick with various diseases. Now, I don't want to dwell on the fact that we don't know um, the name of Simon's mother-in-law, or as some commentators sometimes say, that she got up and she waited upon them. Um, she got up and began to serve them. I don't think Mark was making a misogynistic point there. I think that rather he was saying that the Simon's mother-in-law was uh, restored to health immediately and was then able to do what she would normally do in her house. And of course, the verb for raising up is very similar to what um, Jesus did for the little girl and to Lazarus, and he himself was raised up. Although very active, Mark does make the point that Jesus took the time to recharge his batteries. While it was still dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. He wasn't allowed to rest for very long because the others came hunting for him, and he said that this work that he needed to do was to proclaim the message throughout Galilee, preaching in synagogues, curing the sick, and casting out demons. In Jesus' time, sickness and mental health issues were associated with demonic powers. Mark is trying to say to us that Jesus was binding the strong man, was bringing in the kingdom of light, bringing in that freedom that enabled ordinary people to worship as God intended, bringing in the kingdom of light and justice and peace. Jan referred to the powers of darkness, the sin and the evil that is still in the world. And one of the evils that we're encouraged to think about this week is the evil of racism. In our Old Testament reading, which is not actually the one set for today, but the one I, that spoke to me, verse 8 of chapter 58, oh, sorry, verse 6, talks about the right type of worship. Is this not the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? 
And in Mark's gospel, this is exactly what Jesus was doing. He was letting the oppressed go free. The touch that Jesus had for the common people, the way in which he healed was very hands-on. At the moment, we're not enabled to touch one another as we would like, unless you're in a household bubble. And that is painful. But we need to remember that we can touch other people's lives by our actions. Now, in this last six months or so, nine months, one of the things that's come to the fore has been the Black Lives Matter campaign. And it has become a common sight for to see sportsmen and women taking the knee, as it is called, echoing Martin Luther King's taking of the knee in protest against the unjust systems in the States. And there has been some backlash. There's been awful, awful um, social media Twitter action against uh, um, and racial abuse against Marcus Rashford and others. And it is so upsetting to realize that the racism still exists. I believe that we need to examine our hearts and minds. I'm not racist, but. I'm not prejudiced, but. And you know that there's going to be a sweeping generalization about a minority or a group that you don't think belongs. And you may be saying to me, oh, well, that doesn't happen in our church, does it? Last year's president of conference commented, Reverend Barbara Glasson, commented that she was mortified to f receive an email from young black minority groups in South London saying that the church has not, the Methodist church has not supported them in their fight against racism. Now I come uh, well, my sending church was a black majority church. And I know the hurt that my sisters and brothers felt as they came over from the Windrush generation and did not find a welcome in a lot of churches. Things are changing, thankfully. But we have to ask ourselves, are we doing enough to challenge the injustice of racism? When we hear on the news time after time that the COVID-19 uh, and the hospital emissions are disproportionately BAME, Black and Ethnic uh, Asian and minorities, we have to ask, why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that black and ethnic minority groups make up a large number of our nursing staff, but they are also amongst the poorest, and that is because of racism. We need to challenge injustice. That's what the Isaiah reading talks about, that it's no good proclaiming fasts and putting on sackcloths and ashes, no good coming to church or paying your dues unless your heart is right. Change needs to start from within and from within us. And when we talk 
about change and equality. One of the cartoons that comes to mind is, uh, I, thought it, I thought it was called the, the uh, level playing field, but it's this of um, everything being equal. This is equality. The smallest and most vulnerable can't see over the fence. We need to strive for equity. And that means that those small and vulnerable are given a helping hand. But when I was searching for this cartoon online, which I'd only seen in the um, equality and equity, I was surprised and quite joyful to find this third picture of this is freedom. The fence has come down. Joyful because to me that is the gospel message that Jesus proclaims freedom for all. And we as Christians need to get that message out. We need to change in our lives, in our country. We need to listen to our black and Asian minority and ethnic minority members and take heed of their stories and what they are saying. It's a worry to uh, cultural leaders that the take up of vaccines in the black community and in the Muslim community has not been as great as in white groups. And there's reason for that, this historical reason. I was really pleased to see imams being vaccinated in mosques and opening the mosques as vaccination centers because in the past, you know, pork had been used in, vaccina in early vaccinations. And so, the reluctance of the, our Muslim brothers and sisters is understandable. Likewise, the black community have memories of unethical experimentation in groups in Alabama especially. Studies that were undertaken that only ceased in 1970 when the outcry of this unethical experimentation of giving placebos to black men when not with full consent and came to light and uh, I think President Clinton apologized publicly for this. So it's understandable and we need to understand, and we need as white Christians to understand the reasons why our black brothers and sisters are reluctant. But we also need to acknowledge the immense service that our nurses, all nurses and doctors within the health service are providing, but also those uh, who are from ethnic minority communities. We're going to listen now to an audio recording that's on the Methodist website if you uh, need to hear it again. And it's from a, a black Sierra Leone um, Methodist nurse. Her name's Grace Penn Timothy. And if you think that that name is familiar, well, her husband is uh, the new Deputy Superintendent of Methodist Central Hall. And he is the brother of Roland, who worships with us when he can. So we listen to that now. Uh, we've been hectic, uh, to say the least. Um, obviously, under the circumstances, uh, we've got obviously the COVID-19 going on. And... Um, but with the COVID, the impact is that um, people are isolating, staff are isolating because maybe they've been in contact or maybe they've tested positive to uh, COVID-19, so they have to isolate for a, a certain period of time. So therefore, that is making it, um, you know, 
um, shortage of staff in, uh, in the department. Um, and not only that, but they, the demand is really, really high. As I say, combining the winter pressures, which are the usual winter pressures, um, and uh, obviously the COVID-19. So it's like a double whammy uh, of um, you know, the, the, the situation at the moment. So yeah, it is, it is um, physically and psychologically uh, demanding. Uh, but as a Christian, we just pray and just take it one, one day at a time. And as you've mentioned, this must be emotionally very draining, having so many patients who come into the hospital who sadly don't get to go home again afterwards. Yeah, it, it is very difficult. And I think the worst part of it as well, because um, under, this, under the circumstances, which is very, very unprecedented, uh, relatives or friends cannot come and visit. So people are dying lonely. People are dying on their own in hospital, which is really, really sad and heartbreaking for all of us. When you see someone, we know that they're dying. We just have to ring their family and friends to say they're dying. They're going to come and see them. Um, it, it's, it's very sad. And, you know, I'll, take, I'll talk to my fellow um, ethnic minority people say, you don't want to put yourself in that situation. And we know how difficult it is to lose somebody and to die on your own with no family or friends around. It's even worse. I love my job. Uh, I like working in any, obviously it's a front line um, of, um, of, of healthcare and social care. As I say, up there, you know, the statistics even show that in London alone, we've got 67%. Um, Sixty-seven percent of people at the front line that in in a, um, black, uh, Asian, and minority ethnic groups, and um, that's why obviously we're seeing the increase of um, uh, people dying from ethnic minorities, um, unfortunately. And also we we'll talk about the factors that contribute to the high mortality when it comes to the BMA people is because of racial inequality, which has been going for ages, and COVID nineteen has definitely exposed that. Uh, it's not something that is gonna it's gonna be solved in a day, but it's something that we have to keep pressing, and hopefully things are gonna work for better. You know, the vaccine is out there. Take it, take it, take it. If you can take paracetamol, if you can take medication from your GP, take the vaccine. Protect yourself. Any immunity is better than nothing at all. And trust me, you don't want to end up in a hospital bed. You know, being intubated and no family or friends. And it's, it's left to us as health, healthcare workers to, 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 to support that person and, uh, as much as we can. And it is really draining you know, um, us as well, healthcare workers, because we ha we're feeling for the patient and so we're feeling for the family and friends. So my advice is, you know what, take it and take advantage of it and then come to some of normality and start seeing our friends, give them hugs again, and go out to meals, and go on holiday, all those things. We're all, we're all looking forward to that. But until when we, we stand together and fight this virus, you know, we're not going to get there, are we? So just trust in God and trust in the scientists. So a prayer for Racial Justice Sunday. God who walks with us ahead beside, behind, above, below and around us. You who journey with wandering and displaced people, clear our eyes to see you in the many displaced sisters and brothers at our borders, gates and doors. Give us just minds and confident hearts to protest, challenge and partner with others, to turn hard, callous and inhumane policies into habits of generosity, compassion and welcome at our gates. And through your spirit, strengthen our resolve to work towards a new world where all can share in a full and flourishing life. Amen. We sing at home the hymn number 611, Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you.
Loving God, we pray for the community and country of which we are a part. For those who are exhausted with caring for others and long for a break. For those who've had enough of restrictions, of not being able to meet with friends and family and feel that they can't stand it any longer. And for those who are angry and frightened, who feel their only hope is just trying to hang on until things get better. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for the leaders of the world as they try to bring this pandemic under control. Give them the wisdom and courage to respect every human life and seek freedom, justice and peace for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for your church. Unite us by your spirit and enable us to witness to the hope that we have in you. Enable us to strive for justice and peace for all, to challenge inequity and injustice where we see it. We pray for our black, Asian and ethnic minority sisters and brothers that their voices and their story may be heard and acted upon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, come to us now, as you have come to your people in every age. We thank you for all who have reflected the light of Christ. Help us to follow their example and bring us with them to live forever in your kingdom. And in a time of quiet, we bring to God those people who are on our hearts and minds who need God's healing touch. So we bring all our prayers together as we say the family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I'd like to say a huge thank you to those who've made this service possible, and to you at home for listening, but also to you for your continued prayers and care of each other and gifts. You will have noticed if you receive the notices either by uh, post or by um, email that there is a letter in there, a pastoral letter. I would ask you to prayerfully consider it about how we give in these times of pandemic. But I'd like also to bless all those gifts both those in kind, those talents, but also the monetary gifts that you send in. Loving God, bless the gifts of your people and use them for your kingdom's sake. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing at home the hymn number 690, The Church's One Foundation, is Jesus Christ, her Lord.
So may God, the giver of hope, fill us with all joy and peace because we trust in him. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us and all whom we love on earth and in heaven, now and always. Amen.